I don't know if you heard about it, it was in the LA Times. Mexico church leader jailed. La Luz del Mundo, the light of the world. Okay. Uh, he's the, the pastor that went from his daddy to his grandfather. Anyway, long history. Child pornography, child porn, child sex abuse. Um, the first tip that you should know something's wrong is when somebody claims to be an apostle. <laughs> okay? And that's what he claims. All right? It's a Pentecostal, not Catholic. They're in East LA, West LA. They have a million followers worldwide. He claims to be an apostle. Do you know that one of the prerequisites to be an apostle that knocks this guy out of the box really quick? Mm -hmm. An eyewitness of the resurrection of Christ. This guy's born too late. <laughs> okay. So it, you, you, you see that if and millions of people are following this guy, and, and it's, it's in the Bible, it's not hard. There are prerequisites to being an apostle. There are 12 chairs, not 13 later in, in heaven. So if these guys are claiming it, then we need to think critically or we end up like a Jim Jones thing. Oh, yeah. We blindly follow people that are making statements that are not accurate. And we don't want to be like that. All right, those are my commercials. I'm going to ask Pastor to be kind enough to open this up and we'll get our outline. All right, everybody, uh, let's bow our heads. Let's pray, God. I'm grateful to you for your love, your mercy, your grace. I'm grateful for this opportunity to delve once again into your name. Yes. And Lord, we pray as you reveal the name of God to us tonight, that we will continue to draw closer to you, recognizing who you are and how you relate to us. Please guide us, open our hearts and minds, that we might receive your word. We do it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right on the okay. Um, we got your outline. Jehovah Shalom. That's what we're going to be hitting uh, tonight. Jehovah Shalom. We have three more to go, which will end up with 12. Once we finish, I'll have a, a, an outline of all 12 and what the word actually is. So it'll be easy. We won't have as much content. And then what we're going to do, as we stated last week, we're going to go around and pray those names in the form of worship act. We're, gonna, we're all going to do it. Watch what happens. Twelve things, so, you know, it should take us about the hour. It's an amazing thing. All attributes of God. If you're visiting for the first time, we, we have another outline, but we took a sidebar. Um, the outline is dealing with the deity of, of Christ and of God, and we're looking at names. I decided to give you something extra, which is these additional twelve names from the Old Testament. And we're on number uh, nine tonight. So, Holy Shalom. So, here we go. Um, I'm going to walk you through the outline. You have it. So, let's go under uh, Roman World One, the name Shalom. That's what we're focusing on. Jehovah Shalom is found in Judges, not coincidentally. You'll see why. Judges actually 6 um, 24. 6 24. Judges chapter 6. Verse 24, let me read it for you, and then I'm going to give you in the next moment, room, 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 the, the backdrop to all of this, why this is coming up. 624, reading from the NIV version, and here's what it says. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace. Okay, uh, there's a reason why he built um um, the altar there because of the situation that took place. We'll get to that later as we work through the outline. So it first pops up Jehovah Shalom in the book of Judges and it means peace. Only one, two. The occasion of its revelation. What was the background that led to this occurring? And so this is not in your outline. I'm going to give it to you before we get letter A. Okay? 200 years since Jehovah revealed himself. As we talked about last Wednesday, as Jehovah Nakadesh, remember that? Which means Jehovah sanctifies. Okay? He, he's holy and he sanctifies. So 200 years have gone by since then. Jehovah Nakadesh has been on the scene that attribute of God sanctifying his people. 200 years go by. Joshua is long been dead now. Okay? That's the backdrop. The land has been conquered and divided by tribes. 
nothing approaching national unity. It's chaotic, okay? Uh, no central government, no central form of worship, okay? Now, it, during this period, the, what's the famous verse in Judges everybody likes to preach or talk about? They all did what in their own eyes? Yes, they did what was right in their own eyes. That's what was going on in their society. After Joshua died, Israel began to forget about Jehovah. That's the start. And they started turning to the other gods, other people surrounding them. And, and they started taking those gods on, forgetting Jehovah. And then a new generation arose within Israel, and they forgot them all together. Forgot them all together. So, Jehovah Jireh that we looked at in the past, which is God our provider, right? From redemption, you know, redeeming and providing uh, uh, the Israelites uh, freedom from, from uh, Egyptian bondage. They don't even know who that is. They don't even remember about that. That was their grandparents. And so now they don't remember that. They don't remember the mighty wonders parting the Red Sea that everybody seems, thinks it's a fable. They don't remember that. They no longer were mindful of this God, Jehovah Rope. Remember that one? It means God had healed. So they were healed their sickness, healed their sorrows, prevented misfortune. They had no idea clueless about that in terms of the personal life. Okay? Uh, Consequently, they suffered a lot of military defeats. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because they turned their back. Here we go again on Jehovah. And let's add the other attitude. Three weeks ago, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Remember what he said? Put the banner up and we're going to rally around him. Remember? And victory will be uh, uh, there as well. They have no idea what that is like. They don't even know. And, and then, what did we look at with uh, last Wednesday? I was thinking Jehovah Machadish about being sanctified. Mm -hmm. uh, they corrupted themselves. They weren't sanctified. Mm -hmm. So here's what they lost. You know, we get the letter A. Purity, peace, prosperity, and liberty. They lost all of that as a people. And it was chaotic. Then Israel had no clue about realizing their destiny as a special group of people. They were set apart, like you and I are as believers. Set apart, used by God, purpose and plan for all of us in this room. Everyone's got a purpose and plan that he has in store. Well, they were clueless to that. Why? No relationship. Not close, one sanctified. He sanctifies, says my father. He didn't have it. Now, letter A, you ready? Now we're going to get to the beat of this. So that's the backdrop. So here we go. Under A, first one, without, the word without. So it's without a sense of mission. Without a sense of mission, there was no common purpose of uniting as one people. You want it again? Mm -hmm. Okay. Without a sense of mission, that they had no relationship with Jehovah now. They took on other gods. There was no common purpose. No common purpose of uniting as one people. They didn't have it. That led to, right underneath it, a one. Excuse me. Yes. Sorry. I can't make out the word, the occasion of its, what is this? Oh, number one. Okay. Uh, number one, the occasion of its revelation. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I don't even think I mentioned that. Well, number two, the occasion of its revelation. So now we're going to look at how this word shalom gets revealed. Why? Okay, so under A, you have A, right? Okay, so under A1, without spiritual vision. Without spiritual vision. Both of the three blanks. They fell prey. They fell prey to the appetites of the lusts of the flesh. 
So here's what happens. When you walk away from God, you put something in, in his place. So you you now you're it's idolatry. Anything you put ahead of God, now you've committed idolatry. If anything to your car. You know how some people buy a car and they'll wax it after they may park it 30 blocks away and they spend more time on that than their own spiritual life. That's their God. So you, that's what happens. Uh, and so for these people, now what happens when that happens, you you have apostasy, you go away from God. When God sees that and you're his kid, he spanks you. How does he do that back then? He allows enemies that are surrounding nations to dominate them. And then here's what happens. Once you you are in that position, what did the Israelites do? They cried on them. And they say, God, forgive us and takes us number two. Repent, right? Don't we do that? We go out, nothing happens, everything's going okay, we don't spend any time with God, all of a sudden the Bible drops out. Or once we get a trial, what do we do? We start running. Where? We come to this impassive sermon on Sunday. We want to get to church. We're telling God, please forgive me for being disobedient. And he's a loving God. He does it. So we have number two. Repentance brought deliverance. Okay? Repentance brought deliverance. And that was through the leadership of the judges during that book. Okay? But it didn't just happen one time. It happened hundreds of times. So it takes us to letter B, which is sort of funny about the book of Judges. It's a period of alternating. It was a period of alternating prosperity and adversity. So they were going back and forth. Good times because they repented and they got delivered. And then they would fall away bad times. And then if we keep going after adversity of sinning and repenting. Sinning and repenting. And they had slavery, meaning being dominated by um enemy uh, uh, countries that surrounded them, they took them as slaves. And then they got delivered. And then they got their freedom. So, get the mindset? This is going on in the book of Judges. All right? Going back and forth. Back and forth. Back and forth. Uh, all right. That takes us to Roman numeral three. Correct? Yeah. Okay. The meaning of the use of the word shalom. Very interesting. So I'm going to go broad and, it will, and how that word was used in the Old Testament. And then we're going to get to the one we want. Okay. So here we go. Under A, it's been used. It has been used as six different uh, transla uh, translations or definitions. So let me go really quick here so we can knock these out. First, as whole, W-H-O-L-E, like the total package, whole, it's been used. Shalom has been used as the whole thing, if you will. That's not what we're after, though. Number two, finished. Finished. Uh, number three, it's been translated as full. Full. And then uh, number four, uh, it's been translated in the as in the physical and material sense of a welfare or well, not the welfare state, I'm not talking that. Welfare like your welfare, is it's well. That, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, uh, number five. Yeah. Yes, four. number four, okay. Uh, in, the, in the physical and material sense. So now we're talking tangible items, you know, the physical and material sense um, of welfare. The welfare is good. At all of that, for example, or well, okay. Um, number five. And there was another one there after mm -hmm. there or, or well, 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 or, or well again. Like well, like well, everything yes. is well. well, okay. In terms of physical and material things, mm -hmm. uh, number uh, five, mm -hmm. uh, pay or perform, mm -hmm. pay or perform. In the sense of completing obligations. 
So, and, and this was especially true in the book of Judges for vows that were taken. You, you're going to perform them. You're going to pay, you know, whatever that dealt with. Uh, and then the last word that Shalom has been used as is perfect. So these are the basic underlying various translations of that Hebrew word. The one we want to focus on that's been used most often is letter B. The word is most often and most appropriately translated peace. Okay, peace. And it's been used some 107, over 170 times in the Old Testament. Translated peace some 170 times, that what you're saying? Yeah, okay. as, as the word peace. Um, so now let's take a look at uh, several uh, sub points under it. Number one, it expressed the deepest, and it still does, desire and need of the human heart. It expressed the deepest, when you talk about peace, it's the deepest uh, desire and need of the human heart. And that's what, uh, that's what humanity wants today. Um, when you're faced with a big trial, if it's a personal trial, we tend to get anxious in our, in our hearts. And what's the biggest need that we have? Yeah, peace, rest. Now, does that mean that the trial goes away? No, 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 no. no. We're going to have those trials. And, and God allows them to develop us. Most of the time, for us to look to him instead of looking other other places. But in it, we can have rest. That's the key to overcoming the trials. Being calm. It's the same thing as a sport. Uh, my, my youngest daughter, I think I've shared it with you, is a skater and um, when we went back to Chicago, she got invited to, to make the world team. She didn't make it. She was only 15. But after it was done, she got fifth out of, they took the 11 top junior world-class skaters in the United States. She ended up fifth. But the night before was the kicker. She got invited to skate in a warm-up with the world-class girls. And I watched her. She was the only junior out there. And, and, you know, I was at first you could see there was some intimidation. Then you could see the confidence level. And when it was done, when we got home, I said, so tell me, what was the biggest thing that you walked away with in Chicago? She said, you know, Dad, uh, I was shooting to be in the top five. I made fifth. But more than that, I now know I belong here. See, I didn't win, and I had a lot of doubt as to whether or not I had the confidence. And so she was so relaxed. That's what we want to be in life when we're facing the critical thing. And we can because the peace doesn't depend on us. That's right. It's on Jehovah. See, and one of his key attributes for you and I is perfect peace. He gives it to us. And we're going to see how here in a second. Okay, so number A, is that where I'm at? Okay, yes, here we go. So you, you're well aware of this one. One of the great names of the Messiah was to be the Prince of Peace. Yes, Isaiah chapter um, 9, verse 6. I'll read it. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Um, and here's what it says, you know, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called. Now look at these adjectives. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. And here's our work. Prince of peace, Jehovah Shalom. That's it. All right, number uh, B. This is interesting. Jerusalem means city of peace. Or possession of of peace. City of peace, Jerusalem. Makes sense now, doesn't it? When Jerusalem means city of peace or possession of peace. Okay. Can I move to C? Or you want me to slow up? Okay. Uh, C. Um, peace 
was the most common form of grieving. Peace, shalom, was the most common form of greeting as it is today. Is the, um, what is it, grieving? Grieving. grieving. Like, like saying hi. Okay. Have you ever seen the traditional Orthodox Jews listen to them yeah. sometimes? Yeah. You'll see when they see each other, the first thing comes out is shalom. Yeah. You, you see Muslims when they say assalamu alaikum, yeah. that means the peace be unto you. God's peace be to you. And then the response is alaikum salam, you know, peace be unto you. So it's still very common today in that area. Um, but the Jews uh, obviously use that quite a bit. A letter D. The word is also used, uh, shalom, in a peace offering. In a peace offering. And I'll give you um, a, a text for that. We won't turn there, but I'll, I'll just so you can have it as a resource. It's Leviticus chapter 3. And Leviticus chapter 7, 11 through 21. And then here's one that we're going to get to before we're done. Uh, number two, it deals with the restoration of fellowship. Restoration of fellowship. Because when we have unconfessed sin in our life or we walk away from God, we lose the fellowship. We have the relationship, we lose the, the fellowship. So it's like my daughters, I'm always their dad. Now, we may not be getting along and they may exit, but the relationship is still there. They're an Ananias. Okay. Now, their fellowship may not be right. Okay. And that's what happens with you and I in our Christian walk. If it's not, you know, right, then our fellowship is broke. But we're still God's child. He still loves us. And it's up to us to restore it. And when we do, peace, we have. Okay, uh, Roman numeral four. Jehovah, the source of peace. This is so important. It's him that is the source of peace. Um, so let's do uh, Roman numeral four under A. Jehovah in his own person. In his own person. That means his own being. Okay. Is perfect peace. Now, that is huge. Perfect peace means nothing can destroy it. That means no trial. No, what the enemy, what Satan, no demonic influence. Nothing can destroy God's perfect peace because it depends on him and his person. Make sense? Yes. And God is almighty. We learned it from the beginning as we started this. All powerful, all knowing. So the peace he gives you is perfect. Nothing can shake it. Not even the gates of hell. Mm -hmm. Not even death. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. And it's yours. That's the most amazing thing. And people run to the therapist to get it. I, I got a call the other day, and this guy, he's having some marital problems. So they went to a therapist. And the therapist finally told him, you know what? I don't know what to do. And I said, well, I thought this guy not trained for this stuff. I said, you know, I'm going to give you a hint. Because he called me and said, what should I do? The therapist said, I don't know what to do. And now he's out of pocket about 600 bucks. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I said, you know, you started at the wrong spot. And he went, what do you mean? I said, you and your wife started at the wrong spot. You're starting with the problem. Start with the relationship. How's your relationship with God? A penny dropped. He goes, wow. Well, you know what? I said, start with that. In the mighty counselor, we'll start to reveal things that you're not doing. That's where you start. Mm. You start with God and move from there, not down here at the problem. If the relationship is skewed, I don't care what you come up with. It's not going to work. And that's in anything. So here's another freebie. 
without paying 500 bucks, you got relationship problems, whether it's with your children or your spouse or your boyfriend, group, I don't care what, whoever it is, any human being, start with God. You start with God, have them start with God, and then work it through from there. You have a counselor who knows you better than anybody. You can't hustle him. <laughs> you, you know, you can also pay counselors. I have know a lot of inmates that did that, you know, with PhDs in front of their name, worked them, and they had no education, no high school education. They hustled them. But God, have you ever have you ever said something and God picks your heart and go, I didn't know. Remember that? You know you didn't mean that. See, only the Holy Spirit can do that. You can, it's bare before God. He sees our heart. So you get right there, and then the rest will see. Because you know what happens when you get right with God? You're more sensitive to him, having him here. Uh, I mean, you hear from him, and then he starts, you start cleaning up stuff. Mm. You, you know? Now, if you think you need to go to a counselor all the time, guess what? You're always going to have a problem because nobody's perfect. You have a fallen nature. Are you kidding me? You, you, you know, you always are going to find things wrong. We have a fallen nature. But that's why we're called sinners. We're prone to do wrong, not right. See? And I have something for the church folks that come to church because I have an issue that I think most are carnal. And I'll prove it today before we're done. And that's what, and that means fleshly. And that's spiritual. And when you're in carnality, you got problems. You want to get out of being fleshly and walk with God closely. See? Now, isn't that is that easy? No, thank you for being honest. That's right. You got, you know, you have the war of the flesh and the war of the spirit, and they're in you, and they're both going at it. And God's spirit wants you to do right. And the flesh and its nature, and then you add Satan <laughs> tempting you because he knows where you're weak. You throw that in, then you throw worldly thinking in, and guess what? It's easy to go south, and that's the bad. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, right? All right, all right, that was a little sermon that didn't mean to go I have a off. question Did you uh, give him a scripture? Um, or do you have a scripture? I'm asking for myself. No, I didn't give him a scripture. I just said, get back to your quiet time with God, spending time with him, asking him to seek your heart and go before him, like you do in, in prayer here, I'm sure, uh, altar prayer, and, and ask the Holy Spirit, reveal what's wrong in, in, in my heart. What's my behavior? You know, so I can confess it to you so that we can be right. And when you and him are right, uh, then the horizontal. It's easier. But if you and him are wrong, you know, you think the horizontal is going to get right? I don't care what problems you identify. You, you know, so that's the key. And Satan would prefer you. That's why it's so hard to have quiet times. He doesn't want you to spend time with him. You know, and that's where your power is. See, the Holy Spirit, and that's where your power and your strength and your wisdom, you know, renewing your mind. You know, all of that. But anyway, all right. To answer your question, no scripture, just general, you know, uh, thinking in terms of going to God. Uh, but I take, I did tell him this. Practice what David did in Psalm 27. David said, if I can just get there, get where? In God's presence. If I can just get there, I'm good with these enemies. He didn't even say it. Take the enemies out. He said, just let me get with you. The rest, you'll handle. And isn't that true with, with us? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, where am I? So one. A -1. A -1. A -1. A -1. A one. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, A1. He is the source of peace. He, God, is the source of peace in his attitude towards us. Now I'm going to give you three scriptures. I think I can do this. Jeremiah, uh, the first one is Jeremiah 29, 11. This is a very um, um, popular verse. You've probably heard it. 
but I'll read it. Um, 2911, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Now, plans to prosper, actually, it's plans for peace. That's the word. And it says, you, to give you peace, in, in essence, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. See the God's source of peace in his attitude toward you and I, that's what God wants for you. What a great thing. You know, um, Psalm 29, another proof text, Psalm 29, um, 11, 29, 11. And do you have that? No, 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 yeah, And I have Psalms 2911. Yes. Yeah. Are you scaring me now? Right. One of those senior moments or something. You know? There I go. All right. The line is starting early. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with shalom, peace. Okay. Um, and then. The last one, Isaiah 26. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 12. Yeah. Verse 12. And it says this. Lord, you establish peace for us. See it? He's the one that does it. That's 26. <laughs> okay. So now we want to look. We looked at the source of peace, Jehovah. Now we want to look at the presence of Jehovah is peace. Uh, under A, Jehovah himself appeared to Gideon. This is an interesting text. We're going back to Judges 6.22. <coughs> 622. And how did he appear uh, to him? Well, when Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Okay, now, and the essence behind this is God giving Gideon even his peace. Letter B Jehovah is peace. Uh, did we do the, uh, get the scriptures on Judges? 622. Thank you. I'm sorry. 622. Jehovah is peace and appeared, appears most appropriately <coughs> and opportunely in the book of Judges. I give that to you again. This is huge now. You're going to see why. Why does this pop up in Judges and not earlier? Uh, Jehovah is peace and appears most appropriately. And opportunely in the book of Judges. Okay. After the conquest of Canaan, Israel should have entered rest. They should have. That was the promised land. That's where they were headed. That's where God wanted them. Once they got there, it should have been rest, peace. Okay. And it was it's that spoken in, in um, Hebrews 4. But Deuteronomy. Um, I think I have. Do you have that? Deuteronomy? Yes. Okay, good. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 9. Let me get that. 12, verse 9. Here it is. Uh, okay. Since you have not reached the resting place, and the inheritance of the Lord your God is given you. There's the, the backdrop, the proof text. Word. They didn't reach it yet. They should have. They did it. Okay. Now, why? Under small a, you have that. Because of disobedience, Israel failed to gain that typical rest. I'll give it to you again. Because of <coughs> disobedience, Israel failed to gain that typical rest. 
you know what you can write on the side of your notes? The book of Judges is chaotic restlessness. That's what you can put on that book. If you read that book, I know some of you have, you will detect a chaotic restlessness throughout that book because of the disobedience. And you know what I thought of as I was preparing this? That's me when I'm disobedient. When I'm disobedient to the Lord and I know that I'm not doing right, and well, let me ask you, is it just me or do you guys, I, aren't, don't you have that restlessness, no peace? When, when we're doing wrong, we know no peace there, right? And uh, that's exactly it. Israel knew no peace because they were no, they no not longer knew God's presence. And so how do you get back? You confess, you repent. Same in our personal walk. If, if we uh, are, are disobedient, we're not going to have that peace. So when the trial comes, and they will come, because we can't get away. We live in a world where trials are. No peace. So you know what we're doing? When we're, when we're in trouble, we're calling all the people, and we're saying, hey, pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. <laughs> and God's and the Holy Spirit saying, well, get right with me first. And you know what? I haven't prayed, but you'll have rest. You'll have your peace. That's what the human heart cries for today. Look at society. They all want it. They all want it. And the people we admire, because we really don't know their life, all the famous people, we think they're, they've got life perfect. And you see they're more restless than anybody. More rest, no rest, no peace. And they're searching for it. And we have it. I'm going to give you a little challenge tonight. Okay. Um, remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? And what would you think if um, you were handing out the bread? Okay. And Jesus took everybody, all of us tonight. And we were to go into the sanctuary. And let's say all of it's packed all the way back here, standing room only. And the pastor says, I want you to pass the bread out that Jesus has made for all these folks. And here's what we do we only get to row five, then we go back to row one. And then we pass the bread out. Once we get to row five, we go back to row one. And rows six, seven, eight through 20 are sitting there. What do you think Jesus would say to us? We're passing the bread. What would he say? Tell me. What do you think he'd say? What do you think the folks would be saying? Hey, yeah. Hey. What are you doing? You're going to the same five rows? What about us? Here's the challenge. You have peace. You got a bunch of folks in this world that aren't eating that bread. And what are we here for? We come to church. All of it's packed. Okay, it's packed. What are we here for? Just to show up next week and be packed again? No, you're to take the bread of life and pass it to folks that are hungry. And how do we do that? We invite them. We invite them on Sunday. We invite them on Wednesday. We invite them when the opportunity is here to take. That's what we're doing. That's what we should be doing. Just showing up in a packed house and showing up next week in a packed house. But what? No, that's not it. People are hungry. They're dying. They don't know the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. So we got to do a creative way to get it out there. I don't know. I'm, the challenge is you ask God, how do you do it? How do you take the bread that pastor gives you and give it to people that aren't here tonight because they don't like church? They don't think about it. They're not coming. Job is yours.
We either are going to live for the day or live for life eternal. You got to make a choice on this one. Anyway, that's my other sermon. Ed. All right. Uh, thank you for those amens. Quickly, because uh, I can finish this. Second Chronicles. Yes. Second Chronicles. Um, 15. Verse 2. Second Chronicles 15, verse 2. I think this is it. Um, uh, you know what? Jot it down. Let me come back to that one. I, I, don't, I think I may have made a mistake on that. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go to Isaiah 57. Not a mistake on this one. No. Isaiah 57, 20 through 21. Isaiah 57, 20 through 21. And let me read it for you. It says, but the wicked, ah, uh, watch this. The wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest. The sinner, the one that doesn't know Christ, there's no rest in their heart. Okay, then we keep going. Whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. But they're after it. They want it. And we can share it with them. All right, and that word wicked means restlessness there in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's what I think when you look at society today, uh, almost done. Um, man knows that he's not well, there's something wrong. You bring me a person in here on Sunday listening to pastor's message, it's unsaid. He knows there's something wrong with him. Now, he may not admit it. You know, to you, but and I'm thinking of myself as an example. When I first came here, I knew something wasn't right with me. <laughs> okay, uh, and and it's what is it? It's enmity between me and God. No peace. Yeah. See, and now there's a need for what? We need to have that peace. How do you do that? There's a price for sin, death. Okay, and so now sin equals death. How do I circumvent that? God's got to offer a sacrifice. And he did it in Judges. Mm -hmm. So that they would have a sin offering that would allow peace, if you will. And he did it with Christ for us. Man has a restless heart. And he'll never find peace. I don't care what other religion he picks. They're made up. They're all frauds. There's not, we're not all, and we're all going to heaven. You know that one? Good luck. <laughs> you know? yeah. And some are finding it out now after they die. Mm. The rest are fake. There's only one true God, and it's Christ. Mm. He's it. And we have the answer. All right, so now, what is key? We need to yield ourselves to Jehovah, who does what? Sanctifies us, makes us spiritually, if you will, perfect. Positionally, God looks at all of us as perfect. Experientially, it's called sanctification. Are we perfect experientially? No, we, we have our faults, right? Yeah. You know, we're trying to grow, be more mature. Uh, how do you get more mature? If you're, if you're a Christian, say you're a baby Christian, how do you get more mature so you don't fall as much? The yeah, the word the word is what we feed on. So when you come Sunday, you hear a pastor's message, you apply it. Okay, the more you apply, the more mature you become, stronger you become, the more insight you have with God because He speaks to you. See, and and He speaks to you and He reveals things to you, and that's the game plan. Is God sacrifices or sanctifies us through him setting us apart. We learned that last Wednesday. Isaiah 26, 2 through 4. Isaiah 20, and then we're going to get to the last one. And I'm going to make it, uh, I think. Uh, 20, actually, write that down. Let's go to Roman numeral 6. Because I, I really, this is the big part right here. Jehovah Jesus, that's our guy. The fullness and perfection of our peace under A. Gideon's name for Jehovah finds its fullest expression in the New Testament. You can abbreviate New Testament if you want NT. 
Gideon's name for Jehovah finds its fullest expression in the New Testament. Romans 15, verse uh, 33. Romans 15, verse 33. And, and here, here it is, 33. It says, the God of peace be with you all. There you go, fullest expression of it. The God of peace. Have you seen this? In some churches, I've seen signs where they go, uh, no, what was it saying? No, uh, no God. No peace. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that is that right? Okay, yeah, it's a play on these two words. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I think I reversed it. Yeah. yeah that's all right. You know, no God. No peace. Okay. And then you have what? Thank you. No. No God. No God. No peace. No peace. Oh. Okay. And that is true. He's the God of peace. And you know him in a, and he's talking personally, not about him, but know him as your personal savior, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh letter B. He also in his own person is perfect peace. Perfect peace. And that uh John 14. Uh, verse 27, John 14, verse 27 is the first proof text. Let me read it for you out of the NIV again. Peace I leave you. You, say, and, and you can look at it. It's shalom. It's the same thing. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Perfect peace. Nothing can shake that. You ask him to give you that peace when you're in a trial. It's an amazing thing when you're in it and the trial doesn't go away and you're calm. Man, it's something. Therapists can't give you that. Medication can't do that either, by the way. Okay? Um, I mean, I'm not saying duck, drop your meds now. I'm saying <laughs> medication to make you, you know, happy. It's a temporary thing. I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Can I just uh, yes, say a little bit more about that? Um, we do this a lot to ourselves as Christians, mm -hmm. which is the same thing that, to be fair, the pharmaceutical companies have learned to. Mm -hmm. Is a pill will make the symptom go away, mm -hmm. but it won't change what's going on with the disease. Mm -hmm. Right. So with the common cold, and many of us are going through it now, or bronchitis, or whatever, mm -hmm. what have you. Um, you take, you know, the day for, and it'll feel better. Mm -hmm. But underneath, at night, when you go through that cough, mm -hmm. and that stuff come out, it lets you know that it was only dealing with the symptom. Mm -hmm. But underneath, the disease was still in progress. Mm -hmm. This is the notion of what we believe as Christians about peace. Yes, a, a, a drug can help, help help you feel better. Mm -hmm. But even the doctors will tell you. I remember this. My late mother-in-law, we took her to the hospital. She had some trouble with her heart. It was palpitating or something. And so the doctor looked at her, examined her, ran a bunch of tests. He came back and he held her by the hand. Mm -hmm. And he, asked, he said, just tell me what's going on in your life right now. He said, there's nothing medically going on. But there's something missing. There's no peace. That's why your heart is going crazy because of peace. And he said, I give you some stuff. I can give you different drugs and stuff, but I can't take away what's troubling you. And the only way that can, the only one who can take away what's troubling us is the Lord. So that's where Pastor Nice is coming from. It's very important to bear this in mind. The Lord can take away what's troubling us. Medication can take away the symptom of trouble. But guess what? And medication only lasts so long, right? Yeah, yeah. So many hours or whatever, yeah. time yeah. release, whatever. Yeah. Then you gotta take more, right? You gotta take more. And they do cause other diseases. Other problem, the other <laughs> side effects, then you gotta take a drug, the, the side effect for the drug moment. So only the Lord can deal with the underlying issue, which in this case is a lack of peace. Okay, so that's that's the idea to keep in mind. Yeah, appropriately said, and let me Let's move through. I want to read this one, Matthew 11, 28 and 29. This is huge. 
Okay, Jesus is speaking, talking about rest or peace. Same word. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest or peace. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. The real you. See? Uh, your mind, emotions, and will. That's what he can give you. And uh, uh, jot this one down. We won't read it because I, I want to get you out on time. Uh, Luke 2.14. You have that one, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Number three. Luke 2.14. And then let's go to letter C. I won't read the, these two. I'll, we'll fill the blanks in. I'll give you the scripture. We'll move to D and E. Those are the big ones. And then we're done. Uh, he preached and promised peace. That is Jesus. He preached and promised peace. Um, two scriptures. Luke 19.42. Have you ever noticed uh, Jesus always kept saying, go in peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. 1942. 1942. Luke 1942. Next time you read the Gospels, notice he always said that. Um, and then Acts 10:36. Acts 10, 36. Could you, uh, could you give me C again? I missed the second word. C, yes. Uh, he preached and promised. Mm -hmm. Preached and promised peace. Um, Luke 1942. And Acts 10 36. Letter D. He accomplished that peace for us. He did it. Romans, uh, great text again. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. And, and, and here's what it says Therefore, since we have been justified, which means just as though we've never sinned, through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's through Him that He gives it to us. All right. Now, this one is the last one. And I'm going to close with this. It's money right here. So I'm going to go slow. OK. The measure of our sanctification, that means our holiness, you know, in terms of being set apart, the measure of our sanctification to him and our continued trust in him. OK, the measure of our sanctification to him and our continued trust in him is the measure of our peace in him. That's something you can reflect on tonight. The text, I'm going to go really quick. Philippians 4, verse 7, and I'm just going to read it, and then I, I just got a quick comment, and then Pastor uh, will... We'll close this out. Um, Philippians 4, 7 says this. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding. In other words, you, you can't figure it out. can't understand it. Will guard, look what it guards, your heart, which is the seat of the emotions, and your minds. His perfect peace guards your heart and your mind. Okay, now. Paul suggests in verse 6 that this verse 7 depends on verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. So Paul is suggesting verse 6 depends on the measure of trust that we have in God. And then look at verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, Paul is saying, or seen in me, put it into practice. So here's what Paul is saying. Depending on your trust and depending on your measure of obedience, that's going to be your measure of peace. That's going to be it. So many believers, this is what I believe, and uh, probably will maybe get upset, but it's all right. Eight, I'm going to take it from Romans 8, 6. It says this, the mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. I believe that more believers are carnally minded and they lack peace in their life. Just my thinking from what I've seen as a pastor and people that are coming to me. 
that they just don't have it. And then the thing that drives me nuts is you have it. Mm -hmm. He gives it to you mm -hmm. if you're walking with him in the power of the Holy Spirit. And nothing can shake it. Nothing. Pastor. <clears throat> Martin Luther King uh, is who we typically think of in the modern era as a champion for, a spokesman for, a drum major, if you will, for peace. Mm -hmm. And certainly he had an impact and there was a change in law and there have been subsequent changes in law at the federal and state levels. Yet over 50 years after King, uh, in race relations, y'all, we still have not reached peace. Mm -hmm. We are a full generation after I have a dream and we still have not reached Why is that? Because ultimately the issue, the reason we don't have peace with each other is because we don't have peace with God. Mm -hmm. I say you're not going to be able to get it right here if you haven't gotten it right here. That's our mission, church, our mission, spreading the gospel, that the world might come to know who the Lord is and that by the Holy Spirit, he would change our hearts. As we can see, the law won't change it. Social behavior won't change it. What's in the movies won't change it. The only thing that's going to change it is the Lord God himself. And he changes it through us and the love we have for each other and for the world. Mm -hmm. With that, Jehovah Shalom. Let's all grab hands to somebody close to you. We're going to close out tonight. Does everybody touch to somebody? Okay, let's. Oh, yeah, we want to bring, we want to bring the circles together. Thank you, Deacon. Come on, let's pray. Father, I'm grateful to you for this reminder of your name, Jehovah Shalom. Yes, the Lord, our peace. God, we are grateful to you for this reminder that peace doesn't come from what we do or how we engage. It comes from you and it shines through us, but it's you that's shining. God, I'm praying that you help us, therefore, to love one another, to spread this gospel, to tell everybody we know, I know the Lord Jesus, and he is the one I trust. Why? Because forgiveness of sin comes from you. And as you forgive us and cleanse us, it allows us to have peace with you that enables us to have peace with each other. Mm -hmm. Father, please guide us now. Protect our hearts and minds with your peace that the world might know who you are through us. Please do it in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. 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 God bless you. All right. All right, bless you.